my question to you is how will your policies positively uh, how will your policies directly affect students and why should a university or a college student vote for you over the other parties the short answer is uh, jobs uh, right now Ontario has the largest difference between general unemployment and youth unemployment we're tied with Nova Scotia for that uh, that number uh, we have to do a better job at creating jobs and if you look at the education system today we're not graduating young people for the jobs that exist we're graduating young people for jobs that existed 20 years ago and a lot of people say that sounds like a, a slogan what the heck does that mean uh, let me put it into real terms because you'll have friends um, that are in this position last year we graduated 9,000 teachers for 5,000 teaching positions we graduate every year double the amount of new teachers than we need Conversely, I'm in Kitchener-Waterloo, meeting with some tech companies there. I had one company, Desire to Learn, uh, they, uh, uh, education software company. They hired 300 new employees last, last year because they're booming, and they got half their employees from the U.S. I said, well, how can you get them from the U.S.? We got smart students in, in KW. And they said, well, the deep programming we need uh, is not available in our academic institutions. I want to make sure if there are jobs that the, the school system, the academic journey matches them. Um, and, if a, and if a university needs to change the program they want to, I don't want there to be delays with the province for that approval. Um, I look at the skilled trades. There's huge shortages in the skilled trades in Ontario right now. Huge shortages. And yet we've got rid of shop class for most uh, high schools. When I went to high school, I had shop class. I was horrible in shop class and decided to become a lawyer, unfortunately, instead. <laughs> but there was, there was people who went to shop class and they were fantastic and they went into the skilled trades. I'm in Sudbury at Cambrian College. There was 10 times the job offers in their power line program than there was graduates. Radiation safety at Pembroke, same thing. Way more jobs than there is graduates. There are lots of fields where there's jobs. The conference board and the chamber said that we lose over $3 billion a year, the government does, for jobs available, advertised in Ontario, that we can't fill. So the question is, what, I'm, what am I going to do to help students? I'm going to make sure I fix the education system so we graduate young people for jobs that actually exist. As someone hoping to be the, the province's next premier, what do you actually stand for and why should we, the people of Ontario, give you our vote? I think it's important for a leader uh, of a party to lead and to set a direction. And it doesn't necessarily always have to, has to be how the party's done it before. When I was um, an MP in Ottawa for nine years, the leader of the party there was Stephen Harper. And at the time, the party opposed gay marriage. My perspective now that I'm the leader of the party is that you need to move on with the times. And frankly, my personal opinion is I don't care who you love. None of my business, none of government's business. Uh, and people thought it was controversial two years ago when I marched in the Pride Parade. First PC leader to take an official delegation. Um, how can he do that? And I had some supporters who were upset with me. But frankly, uh, my party was on the wrong side of that issue. And it's never, never too late to um, do the right thing. And it's good, to do, it's good to evolve. It's good to um, uh, accept uh, positive change. And, uh, like I said initially, I'm not interested in revisiting divisive social issues. I want to focus on what matters right now in Ontario, and that's creating jobs. Because if you don't have jobs, you don't, if you don't have people paying income tax, then you don't have the money to support great post-secondary education and hospitals and the environment, and you have to create jobs to have revenue. And the reason we're seeing cuts right now in Ontario is because we're not creating jobs. Ontario has the largest national debt of any jurisdiction in the developed world. This carries a huge interest burden that is pushing the province further away from balancing the budget. As leader of the PC Party of Ontario and potential Premier of Ontario, explain what steps you would take to reduce Ontario's provincial debt, which is expected to reach $318 billion this year and is already having serious fiscal impact on the annual budget. But I really want to change the culture at Queen's Park. Right now, they spend um, in, a, in a manner that, that I, I just think they don't value a taxpayer dollar. Have you looked at, you talked about the Auditor General's reports. This government's been there since 2003, and you get, once a year, you get an Auditor General's report. And no matter who's in power, when you're in power, you're going to get an Auditor General report. 
But in the private sector, I sit on a bunch of boards, we get an auditor's report. When they're not doing it, we say to management, fix it up, come back with a report to us. If you don't fix it up, you're fired. Doesn't happen in government. Are you going, have you read well, the Auditor General's reports? What's, what's supposed to happen is that if the Auditor General says the government's incompetent, that the voters fire them. Um, uh, and but, so I'm, I'm hoping, based on the Auditor General's report, okay, that voters will, will render that decision. But I think one of the Auditor General's frustrations is that there all these all these recommendations have been ignored. The, the, the energy crisis was, was raised four or five years ago, and all the recommendations were, were ignored. And so, yeah, I, I think if you have an, an Auditor General's report and they're serious recommendations, um, they should be honored, they should be acted upon. So you will commit, as leader, to read the Auditor General's report, and I'm assuming the electorate is gonna put you in there we're going to come back every year, they read these reports and hold people accountable. I will like be horrendous. accountable to the Auditor General and I'll be accountable in Ralph Lean's class. Good, good. For the Auditor General's reports. For the Auditor General report, good. What alternative actions or legislation do you believe the province must implement in order to strike a balance between their environmental responsibility and making energy affordable for Ontarians? Um, we don't need this energy. We've given away $6 billion in surplus generation. It's not about green energy. Our own water power, Niagara Falls, we don't run at full capacity. We have hydroelectric projects in northern Ontario we've mothballed. We spill water power every day. We've signed bad 20-year deals and we give it away. People say, Donald Trump wants to make America great right now. And I say, I'm not sure it's Donald Trump making America great, it's Kathleen Wynne. She's giving free electricity to Michigan, Pennsylvania, Ohio, and New York, and she's not looking at those contracts because they're her friends. I'll look at those contracts. If there are legal outs, if there's exit clauses like there was in the Samsung deal, I'll take them because I can't afford to, I can't afford to have Ontario struggling in, in energy poverty. Thank you for coming in today. So my question is, students in Ontario are paying the highest average undergraduate tuition fees in Canada. In fact, they have tripled since 1993. A CBC article was written last year titled, Ontario Budget 2016, New Grant Will Cover Average Tuition for Low-Income Students that discussed the Liberal government's plans on increasing financial aid. You commented on this by stating that while the government boasts they are helping people, it is really just canceling one program to pay for another. Can you please explain what alternative measures the Conservative Party would take instead to address this issue? One thing I, I, I'm not a fan of is political PR stunts. And so they said everyone's going to get free tuition. How many people here have free tuition? Okay, none. So, it, the reality is it, it's, it's a shell game. They're canceling some programs, replacing it with others. It's the same amount of money in the system. Um, if you actually wanted to help people, make sure that the, the, the tuition help that's available is targeted towards uh, academic journeys that will lead to a job. Maybe the government doesn't need to subsidize 9,000 teaching spots if we only need 5,000. Why don't we subsidize 5,000 teaching spots if we know there's 5,000 jobs that will be needed each year and use the savings towards people studying courses that will lead to a career. We know we need more engineers. We know we need more technology. We need, we, we need more skilled trades. I, I, you know, frankly, I, I want to use the carrots the government has to help young people afford um, courses and programming that will they'll lead to a job. That's what it comes down to. I, I'm going to make it easier for those that are going to follow a path that will lead to a job. With the condition of the roads declining and the number of people relying on them increasing, the issue is becoming very pressing. So my question to you is what would your plan be to help solve the issues surrounding transportation infrastructure in Toronto? So Toronto is a world-class city and it needs world-class transit. And you go to um, other cities around the world, you know, in London you see a phenomenal transit system. I don't think the solution is putting road tolls on roads that people have already paid for. Um, and that's why I uh, challenged Kathleen Wynne on her road tolls and, and saying that she, this shouldn't be uh, her, her solution to John Tory's, um, the financial challenges in the city of Toronto. You, if you do it for Toronto, you have to do it everywhere else. And so it opens up the, do the door to having road tolls everywhere that the folks in Mississauga are saying, you put road tolls in Toronto, then everyone who's going to the airport should pay a road toll to Mississauga too. Up uh, in the 905, they're saying everyone who's going to their cottages, they should pay a road toll too. So it's, 
it created a war of, of municipalities wanting road tolls, and that's not helpful. Let's, let's look at the case of the city of Toronto. The road tolls would have got them as high as $170 million a year. The infrastructure budget is $160 billion over 12 years. So we're talking about a much bigger uh, source of revenue that Toronto, as the largest city, was going to get a pretty significant share of. According to Auditor General, we're seeing performance, um, no performance management, uh, no, no comparisons, no competency on the spending of that $160 million. In some cases, we saw overpayments of 35%. What would 35% on $160 billion be? And what would Toronto share be? If we actually spend our infrastructure dollars wisely, Toronto's going to get a heck of a lot more than $170 million a year for, 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 for transit and infrastructure. Um, and, and I'm eager uh, to partner with John Tory and make sure we finance the infrastructure the City of Toronto needs. Do you believe that those who suffer economic losses and hardship under the Wayne government could be made whole by your government, which specific damages uh, which specific damages are you planning to reverse? What we can reverse um, is, you look at the Green Energy Act and some of these bad contracts, right now the government's not sharing with us the contracts. But we managed to get one of the contracts, the Samsung deal. On the Samsung deal, there was exit clauses for a billion and a half, which was a good part of the contract. If there are similar exit clauses, um, I can unwind some of this. Uh, LRP1, which is what's to be built in the next five years, the government's standing by, but it, the notice to proceed hasn't gone out. And so if the notice to proceed hasn't gone out, I can stop those as well. It depends when the election is. Um, right now it's scheduled 16 months from now. If it's called earlier, we can, we can mitigate um, more damage. Uh, we will try to undo as much of this damage as we can, but you're absolutely fair to say that not all of it can be undone. If your party will be elected in 2018, how would you change the billing structure for electricity in the future? As well, do you think it is possible for Ontarians to receive retroactive payments for previous years? So what's done in the past, I, I think it would be impossible to go back on. You can't receive retroactive payments. Uh, uh, but I do believe we can look at these contracts. As I said before, um, right now, Kathleen Wynne doesn't want to touch them. She says you can't touch them. Well, we know that's wrong because the Samsung deal actually had an exit clause for a billion and a half. If she opens up and shares with the public the other contracts, I think where there's a will, there's a way, and there could be routes to uh, minimize the damage of, of this excess generation. Um, ultimately, it's who's willing to do it. I think you've made a good start rebranding the fundamental values of, the, of your party by being the conser first conser conservative leader um, to take part in the Toronto Pride Parade, showing your commitment to inclusivity. And um, you further showed opposition to Mr. Hudak's proposition to cut 100,000 pu public sector jobs in mentioning the public sector should be seen as a partner and not an adversary. What strategies will you use in continuing to rebrand your party's image and detract from the strategies the previous candidates utilized in only targeting winnable writings? How will you achieve a tr traditional right-wing platform while engaging to the prog progressive voters of Ontario? Well, I like to say I'm a pragmatic progressive conservative. A good idea can, from any, can come from any corner. You say, how are you going to have a traditional right-wing platform? It doesn't have to be a traditional right-wing platform. You know, one of the things that annoyed me, frustrated me about Queen's Park was before I won the leadership of our party, the PCs had voted against the Liberals something like 3,000 times in a row, and the Liberals had voted against the PCs about 3,000 times in a row, and the same with NDP. My party actually announced they're voting against the Liberal budget one year before they even saw the budget. I'm like, how can you be against something without even seeing it? They announced they're going to vote against it without even seeing it. And so my, my philosophy is this. There's no monopoly on a good idea. And a good idea can come from the NDP. It can come from the Liberals. Um, it can come from the rhinoceros party. A good idea can come from any corner. And if it makes sense for Ontario, we'll support it. We'll include it in our platform. It doesn't have to be left or right. It's, it's what's going to advance the economic prosperity um, and quality of life in the province of, of Ontario. Um, and I think we're seeing this approach um, ooze into the, the PC party. Our membership is reaching record heights. 
When I ran for the leadership of the party, we had 10,000 members, and now we're approaching 100,000. And one thing that I say again and again is, it doesn't matter where you're born, what your faith is, what the color of your skin is, whether you belong to a union or not, or who you love, you have a home in our party. Um, and the beautiful thing about our membership today is it's younger than it's ever been, it's more diverse than it's ever been, and I'm going to continue to do whatever I can to encourage that. As the leader of the Ontario PC Party and a potential future premier, is there an opportunity in terms of international relations that you would say, can, that you would say Canada should be utilizing but is not? And I toured uh, Ryerson in Mumbai has their DMZ uh, um, job inc incubator for innovation in the Mumbai Stock Exchange. It's incredible. Uh, I toured the DMZ earlier uh, today. here today. Love what Ryerson's doing on that. Uh, it, it, talk about job creation. That is a, a model example of, of how to do it. In terms of, of India, uh, I do think we should be looking at new export markets. We can't be simply reliant on the U.S. and we should be looking at ways to facilitate um, marketing Canadian product uh, to all the emerging uh, markets in the world. Uh, India's gr growth is, uh, you look at India, China, Brazil, this is some of the most impressive uh, growth markets and we have a natural relationship with India. We have 1.2 million Indo-Canadians. The relationship, the family to family connections give us leverage. A Canadian flag, if you're in a Chandigarh or Amritsar or Gandhinagar means something, um, and, and, and I think we should uh, leverage that and build on that friendship. The majority of students in this course right now are around the age you were when you were elected into the Barry City Council. So I would just like to see your point of view on, and any advice on how to network, not just fast, but efficiently as well. Um, what I'd say to anyone in this class is age is not a barrier. Um, we have a democracy that is very open. Um, I like to think I'm a I'm young veteran now. I'm 38 and I've been at this since I was 22, um, at three levels of government now. And one thing that I think is beautiful about Canada is that I, I think there, is not, there isn't a barrier on age. There's always one or two people that might be ignorant towards someone who's younger, but that's the remote minority. If you want to get involved in public service, you want to get involved in politics, no matter what the party is, they will all welcome you. Um, with open arms, uh, and we have, a, we have a litany of examples of young city councillors, young MPs, young MPPs. Frankly, most of the staffers at Queen's Park are all young people because they have the energy to, to keep up the pace. Uh, we have a system that welcomes involvement, uh, and if anyone has caught the political bug at listening to Ralph's lectures, my advice would be get involved. Uh, and. Uh, and frankly, there's too much apathy out there, and the more people that get involved, uh, no matter what party you pick, is a very good thing. My scorecard, competence, I give you an A+. Plus. I'm a tough marker. Uh, authentic, A+. Plus. And I really think you're a likable guy. So vote Patrick Brown. Thank you.